Hello, and welcome to today's webinar titled Managing Risks on an Urban Farm. My name is Andy Pressman, and I am an agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, more commonly known as NCAT. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization who works on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. Today's webinar focuses on managing some of the risks associated with commercial urban farming. Over the past several years, I have had the opportunity to work with many urban farmers throughout the country, as well as helping start and manage an urban farm. Much of my work focuses on understanding the risks involved with urban farming and to help farmers implement best practices for managing risks. Today, we will hear from two farmers who I find excel in managing certain risks that are commonly shared amongst urban farmers. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I want to be sure to mention a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the ATRA website within the next few days. For those of you unfamiliar with ATRA, it is the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service and is a project of the National Center for Appropriate Technology. ATRA provides publications, technical assistance through our telephone hotlines and website, webinars, workshops and trainings, and other information to farmers and educators across the country. Technical assistance is offered free of charge, and ATRA is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we are grateful for their support. Second, as you're listening to today's webinar, please note that your microphones are muted. The presentations will last about one hour, and we will be addressing questions you may have for the presenters at the end of the presentations. You can type in any questions you have in the question pane you see on your screen. If we are unable to get to any questions during the webinar, an ATRA specialist will follow up with you within the next few days. Third, I want to ask our viewers to take a few minutes at the end of the webinar to complete the survey that will appear on your screen after you close the webinar. Your feedback is very important, and I want to thank you for taking the time and helping NCAT better understand and assist you in addressing your farming needs. And now, I just want to mention a few points related to today's topic on managing risks on an urban farm. First, I want to mention that many of the risks facing urban farmers today have been identified through a project I am involved with in partnership with New York University and Penn State University. The project is being funded by the USDA's National Institute for Food and Agriculture and involves a national study of commercial urban farms and provides education and technical assistance to urban farmers. This is the second webinar being presented as part of the project and the first webinar in which Dr. Carolyn Dimitri discussed the research results on the viability of commercial urban farming is available on the ATRA website. Finally, I want to mention that while this webinar focuses on urban agriculture, you will see from the presentations that the farms are very different in nature. With this in mind, it is important to note that for this project and webinar, the research team defines an urban farm as being in or around a city and includes peri and suburban farms. On that note, I want to thank you all for taking the time today to be a part of this webinar. As I mentioned, our presenters have extensive knowledge in managing risks, including soil contamination and fertility, intensive crop production and planning, aquaponics, and marketing. Next slide, please. Our first presenter is Eric McClam. Eric is the farm manager and co-founder of City Roots Urban Farm. City Roots is a certified organic urban farm located on contaminated soils in Columbia, South Carolina. Eric is a graduate of Tulane University School of Architecture and in partnership with his father, the McClans have overcome great challenges to bring healthy and local food, and I should add, an incredible Mardi Gras festival to Columbia, South Carolina. Thanks, Eric, for being with us today, and I'm going to turn things over to you. Thanks, Andy. Again, my name is Eric McClam. I am the co-founder of City Roots Farm located in Columbia, South Carolina. 
Um, I'm going to first start by giving a little bit of history of the farm and how and why we started. Um, next slide, please. We established the farm in 2009. Uh, the inspiration for City Roots uh, really was initiated by growing power. And one of the first steps to reduce our risk was to not recreate the wheel. Um, we went up to Growing Power's commercial ag program, spent a three-day weekend once a month for five months to learn about their microgreen and aquaponic production. And then we brought that information back to Columbia, South Carolina, where we're from, and adapted to our climate and our setup, and we've really kind of taken off from there. Um, our vision is to produce clean, healthy, sustainably grown products while educating the public about the benefits of local food. Um, we are certified organic by the USDA. We are also GAP certified, or Good Agricultural Practices, uh, certified by uh, the South Carolina Ag Department. Um, we now currently on our farm grow a pretty diverse uh, variety of fruits and vegetables. We keep bees not only for uh, honey, but mainly for pollination. We also uh, keep chickens uh, not only for their eggs, but fertility that back to our soils. We do some pretty extensive composting, both vermicomposting and in windrows. Uh, we also grow uh, several greenhouses full of microgreens, uh, have an aquaponic system, and do agritourism. So we've diversified it pretty heavily, and I'll explain each one of those in detail as we go along. Next slide, please. So my background was architecture. Um, I finished up school in 2009 when no one was hiring architects due to the economy. So I came back to Columbia, South Carolina to start the farm with my dad. His first job was actually in his father's uh, tobacco fields as a kid. Said it was the hardest job he ever had and would never become a farmer. Lo and behold, in his semi-retirement, he started the farm with me nearly six years ago and um, is there about half the year uh, when he's in town, he's uh, full-time. Um, the rest of the year, he, he spends out of the country. Uh, currently, City Roots has six full-time staff um, and five to seven part-time staff and a couple of paid interns as well. Um, it used to just be me and a part-time guy several years ago. I thought it'd be all alone uh, down at our little farm, but um, it's really picked up steam over the years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the first thing we did was uh, to check into the zoning for our city to find out whether or not uh, farming was an accepted land use. Uh, my dad, being an architect, general contractor, developer, thought he knew something about zoning and assumed an industrial site would, uh, would work. However, we found out that that was not the case. So we went to our zoning board of appeals uh, in front of city council and uh, basically justified to them that a urban farm ha had good merit as a, an accepted land use, and they actually agreed with us. So the next step was to select a site. Uh, we knew that needed to be close to home, just uh, for proximity's sake, makes it a little bit easier for us, but we also wanted to supply where the demand is. Um, once we got the zoning approved, uh, we found a two and three quarter acre site um, that is owned by the city of Columbia and we established a long-term, I guess, five-year lease with them and an option to renew. Um, that lease was uh, about $100 a year plus the cost of property taxes. Um, there is a caveat, though, that they could potentially put a road through our site, which is pretty risky for us, but we went ahead anyway. Uh, however, they would have to pay for the movement of any structures like buildings or greenhouses to a new site um, if they did choose to do so. So if you see in the picture uh, on the right, in the, basically the center there, um, on the left side of that street there, that is our initial location at two and, three, two and three quarter acres. It is bounded on the northwest by a residential neighborhood, the northeast by a number of soccer, baseball, fields, tracks, recreational areas. To the southeast, we are bounded by a uh, small municipal private airport. Um, and the southwest of us is an industrial area um, and a series of switch yards for a rail station. Um, and it's right there in the, basically the center. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did was check our site for heavy metals. Well, let me back up for one second. The site is technically a brownfield. Um, we did our due diligence, checked for heavy metals. Uh, there were none present on the site. However, on the site above us, 
about 25, 30 years ago, there was a laundry service that contaminated the aquifer, um, which in turn, the aquifer is below us as well. So we are currently on city water, city facilities, um, and uh, brought in, next slide, a number of truckloads of city compost. It's essentially their leaf mulch that they let sit and break down over a period of time. It's actually rather fertile stuff. Uh, it's actually organic matter upwards of 10 to 14 percent. Um, like I mentioned previously, we are certified organic. We did um, have to go through a few hoops with our certifier to uh, make sure that it met their standards. Uh, we obviously waited uh, past the three-year mark uh, to do so. Again, did some very extensive testing on both our water and soil, um, and it uh, met their approval. Um, and uh, next slide. So here's where I came, and um, I thought I actually would just be the uh, you know, designated construction builder architect for the building, and thought I'd maybe get involved in the fields for a couple months, and then move back to architecture. But I fell in love with farming, most like most of you probably listen to this, that uh, I really enjoyed it and found it to be a, a great occupation. And almost six years later, I'm running the farm and really enjoying it. Um, but we designed a, approximately a 2,000 square foot building that uh, basically mimics the tobacco barns of my father's youth. as a large clear story for light and ventilation, lots of windows and doors for cross ventilation, so it's naturally ventilated. Um, it also houses our retail space, our small office, walk-in cold storage, uh, and our tool shed, which we built our own cold storage using a CoolBot, uh, which is a great little device that uh, is way less expensive than having your own walk-in cooler. Um, next slide, please. Um, so basically this is, this is an older AutoCAD drawing of, of the farm layout, um, but uh, our fields, uh, we're now kind of going to more and more greenhouse and high tunnel production. We really are seven days a week um, in our production, both in, in the greenhouses, specifically for the microgreens. Um, and what we're also finding is that, uh, next slide, that uh, four season production and diversifying what we do is the best way for us to mitigate risk for uh, cash flow concerns. Um, we do a uh, you know, CSA over the winter as well and continue producing and high tunnels allow for us to do some season extension along with row covers as well. And it really kind of uh, allows for us to, um, to continue growing. Next slide, please. Um, the first greenhouse that we constructed was an old tobacco greenhouse that we disassembled from another farm and reassembled on site. So ironically, went from growing poison to growing healthy organic food. Um, in this greenhouse, uh, we have an aquaponic system, which is the combination of, to define that word for you, aquaculture, um, production of fish commercially, and then hydroponics are growing plants in a water-based medium. Um, and uh, basically we have a 3,500 gallon tank with about 1,500 tilapia in it. We cycle that water through the raised plant beds which serve as the biological filter for the tank. Um, so we harvest the tilapia and we also harvest and sell the nasturtiums and watercress growing inside as well. It's a great uh, teaching tool. Um, for a lot of the students that come through. But it's also just kind of neat and just kind of put us uh, on the map, uh, kind of on the uniqueness factor and has brought a lot of people into the farm. Next slide, please. Quite frankly, we've probably harvested and sold a lot more of the watercress and nasturtium than we have the fish. That's been a little bit harder to market and we've had a couple, uh, we had a power outage, we lost some fish a while back, but luckily uh, we have, uh, well, to be frank, we have quite quite good insurance, so uh, they actually cover the first batch, but we have a backup generator and everything now, so we do have some redundancies in place, so that was kind of a risky uh, problem that did occur, and we rectified that now currently. Next slide, please. Microgreens are, probably constitute uh, about 40, 45% of our gross revenue. Um, we have approximately 9,000 square feet in greenhouse now, and produce probably about 1,500 pounds of microgreens a month uh, at, at peak. And um, we really have found this to be a great niche market for us. It's kind of on a production scale, almost like a little uh, tiny farm factory there. Um, the production really for our micros in, in the summer, we've got kind of our peak uh, from germination to 
to harvest can be as little as seven to ten days. In the wintertime, it's much longer due to day length. Um, let me define microgreens for you guys or explain those again. Microgreens are, are very similar to sprouts. The major difference is they're grown in soil, so they don't have that waterborne contamination issue. Uh, typically, it's the first growth out of the seed. It's the cotyledon leaf or the dicot that first comes up. When it is the most nutritional, it's all that nutrition stored and energy out of that seed before it gets its true leaf. Um, some findings have said that it's about three to five percent, sorry, three to five times more nutritional than the fully leaf uh, end product. Um, and we've really found a great niche for that for us. Um, we currently sell to, uh, typically we do about uh, 12 to 15 whole foods in our region. I found out this morning that we are going to do a promotion with, a, with them for all 32 stores in the region for a two week period um, upcoming in February, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, and we do what's called backhauling through the local store. So they basically, the regional uh, group sends us a purchase order for all stores in the region. We deliver it to their local store here in Columbia, and then they distribute it back through their regional distri distribution, which is a great two miles to the grocery store, and um, it's rather convenient. Next slide, please. We do keep some chickens. Our city does allow for um, chickens within the city limits, but do make sure to check your um, city's ordinances to find out whether or not they allow for them or not. Um, we sell some eggs, but it's mainly for people that come to the farm. They want to see chickens because they assume that every farm in the world has chickens, which uh, for us is kind of part of the agritourism side. Next slide, please. We do have a small apiary. Uh, we, we keep some beehives, uh, and that's mainly for pollination. We may extend that uh, a little bit this year and uh, try and sell some honey, but it really is to make sure that we have proper pollination on our farm. Next slide. Uh, we do some pretty extensive composting. Um, we collect uh, uh, some compost from a local small grocery store down the road and also uh, out of our fields. We combine that with wood chips we get for free from a local tree cutter. He'd have to pay to take them to the city. We combine those with our tractor, with our front end loader, and uh, turn that periodically, and then amend our soils with our compost. So the, uh, again, reducing the amount of uh, uh, money that we need to spend on fertilizer, essentially, um, and adds to fertility to our soil. So reduces uh, our you know expenses, and that's uh, you know expenses are a risky part of. Uh, any farm budget enterprise. Uh, we do also do vermicomposting or composting with worms, and that is mainly for uh, collection of worm castings uh, in which we mix into our soil, mix for propagation and for our biker green production. Next slide, please. We have a conservation innovation grant through the uh, USDA uh, to convert our farm into no-till production, which we are in the third year of that grant. Essentially, we plant a multi-species cover crop, roll that in place, which leaves a uh, mulch, and then go through with you know, the green implement on the back of that tractor there is a residue slicer and double dish opener that opens a furrow, and then it's followed by Jang precision seeders to plant into it. And then the red implement on the top left is a roller crimper, um, which we roll the cover crop down with. Next slide, please. Uh, which, you know, ideally you'd cut down on the amount of time spent on the tractor, retains moisture, adds fertility, and then the crop would just grow right through it, which sounded great uh, before we started, but it's uh, proved to be much more difficult. And this is something that we would not have probably done on our farm if we did not have a cost share grant program um, that uh, helped us with that. Um, and that did pay for a portion of those implements and it pays for all of the research being done by a professor at the University of South Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. So that was a pretty risky endeavor. And what we found, um, it, we have a couple other sites that we now are, are starting to grow on. We have a, um, a partnership now with a local high school. It's uh, right kind of in the suburbs periphery of the city and at least about four and a half acres from them. This year, for the first time, we're putting uh, about three acres of that into production. Um, we did try and plant some uh, cucurbits out there last year with, with no-till. And um, if you've seen the bottom left picture, that's uh, Johnson grass that's over my head. Um, realized that uh, we really needed to switch our methodology there and have gone to tractor-mounted uh, cultivation. 
Uh, we also have a family-owned farm that um, is about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes from our farm, and we'll be doing no-till down there. Um, and what we're finding is that uh, there are some some problems with it, but we're, we're learning as we go along. Um, which, you know, having the urban farm, it's um, the great outlet uh, to be within the city, but we've quickly outgrown our space and really realized we have a pretty big market and we like to fulfill that and have found other sites and opportunities to do so. Next slide, please. So, like I mentioned previously, we do on-farm sales and we're open to the public Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. We also have a beer and wine license because we do a number of events on the farm. So we do sell beer and wine. Those are the only products that we sell on the farm that we do not grow ourselves. Everything we sell, we have grown on our farms. Um, so that's something that we say stay consistent with and our con customers tend to enjoy that. Next slide, please. We've traditionally done a CSA or community supported agriculture uh, for approximately 50 to 60 people. This year with increased acreage, we'll, we'll increase it to about 100. And our, we don't have a drop off location since our farms in the city, they come to the farm to pick up. Next slide, please. Uh, we do sell to one food hub uh, about an hour and 45 minutes away in Charleston, South Carolina called Grow Food Carolina. Um, even after the 20% they take for marketing liability distribution, uh, to about 150 restaurants and grocery stores in the area. We still make more um, per pound down there than we do in Columbia because they have a much better market than we do. So I definitely recommend uh, anyone to check into some food hubs. They've been a great success for us. Next slide, please. We do sell to our local Whole Foods, um, uh, another group called Earth Fair, and a couple other smaller grocery stores. Um, we realized once we no longer were looking our customers directly in the eye at the farmer's market that um, we needed for them to know um, that we are organic and the best way to do so is to be certified by the USDA and have their uh, seal on it. And that has really um, been incredibly helpful for us and um, helped us grow. Next slide, please. We do sell at uh, a Saturday farmer's market um, year-round, 52 weeks out of the year. Um, and that's about 10% or less of our gross sales, but it's a great to have a presence there. Next slide, please. We do have a small U-Pick operation for blackberries, blueberries, and muscadines on the farm. It does draw people in and it's uh, been rather, uh, rather good for us. Um, but again, we're a small urban site, so it's not a huge portion of what we do. Next slide. One of our main components and our mission of our farm is to educate the public, and the best way we find to do that is to, uh, to educate the youth, our future farmers. Uh, we do charge for participants for that because it does take time out of our day and our staff. Um, and we've had thousands of participants ranging from kindergarten kids to college students to my grandfather's retirement home. So you name it, they've come to the farm. Next slide. And we do try and uh, tailor that to their curriculum or any needs they may have. Um, we do a lot of agritourism on the farm. It's about 20, 25% of our gross revenue. We found that we can rent out the farm as a special event venue. Uh, we do have Mardi Gras coming up in a couple of weeks with three or 4,000 people, a tomato festival in the summer with a couple thousand people as well. And um, it really has brought in a lot of revenue. Next slide. We do an on-farm dinner uh, once a month. Um, and uh, actually, go back one slide, please. Uh, actually, sorry, I forward again, my apologies, um, once a month, and uh, we do 75 to 100 people, and uh, it's really um, been able to showcase um, you know, what farm products we have. Next slide. And it's in partnership with an event planner and, um, and restaurateur. Next slide. Uh, we put our logo and brand on everything that leaves the farm. Um, we do a little bit of advertising, and um, you know we have signage up and around the farm, and it really it seems to help bring people uh, some awareness to where we are located and what we're doing. Next slide, please. We do have a um, pretty good uh, presence on social media. We have our own website, um, and we send out uh, twice a month a newsletter, and twice a week we send out newsletters to our chefs to allow them to know what we've got for sale, and we deliver twice a week as well. Next slide. 
this upcoming year, um, we are um, going to be growing some cut flowers, which that is on the top left picture. Um, that is the site uh, where the aquifer was contaminated. We cannot grow anything uh, in ground there that is edible um, per our lease, nor will we actually want to either. We brought in city compost there too, but uh, we'll be growing cut flowers there. Um, and then on the back portion of that site where there's a concrete slab, we have our windrows for composting. We've also uh, constructed, a, in the bottom left picture, a whole new greenhouse for microgreens. And as of this morning, I've already filled it up, and we've only had it built for about a month um, to handle our micro microgreen production. And then one next to that, we actually built specifically for our events, for venue rentals, and it will house some of our propagation as well. And then we've also begun growing oyster mushrooms in a warehouse adjacent to the site that we do have a lease on through that same site too. Um, next slide, please. Um, we really wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for the community around us. Uh, we were able to borrow equipment from friends, colleagues. Uh, we've had volunteers from uh, the university. We've had interns from the university, um, great neighbors. And um, really, without them, we wouldn't get to where we are today if it wasn't for the uh, outreach of our community around us. Next slide. And again, diversity has been an incredible asset to us and has reduced our risk um, because we have alternate cash flow um, and our community has been a big supporter and we're really um, looking forward to a big new year this year. And I will stay on for questions uh, later on. So if you do uh, have any, please uh, send them in. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, Eric. We really have some great questions that have come in, but before we begin with the question and answer session, uh, we're going to hear from our second presenter, Greg Maslow, who is going to focus a little bit more on uh, technical components of intensive production, uh, field production. And so Greg has been the farm manager. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Greg has been the farm manager at Newton Community Farm since its inception in 2006. The farm is located in Newton, Massachusetts, a city of 80,000 just on the outskirts of Boston. Despite it being in such close proximity to Boston, interestingly, it has been more or less actively farmed for the past 330 years. I have no hesitation in saying that Greg is a leader in intensive crop production to which he has designed systems to provide for an 80-share Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA, program, a weekly farmer's market, a five-day-per-week on-site farm stand, and donations to local food pantries and shelters all on one acre. Before coming to Newton Community Farm, Greg received two master's degrees, one from Boston University where he focused his research on the ethics of genetically modified crops, and one from Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in systematic and philosophical theology. Thanks Greg, and I'll now pass things over to you. Thank you Andy, and uh, welcome everybody who's uh, here for the webinar. Uh, as Andy said, I'm Greg Maslow. I'm the farm manager at Newton Community Farm in Newton, Mass. Um, we are a, uh, I guess, a suburban farm. Uh, Newton is uh, about nine miles east of Boston. Uh, we have 2.25 acres, uh, of which one acre is uh, used for production. The other uh, acre and a quarter uh, comprises a barn and chicken coop and house and uh, driveway, uh, and then we have a little uh, orchard as well. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be uh, giving a little um, a brief overview of the farm and then talking, as Annie said, specifically about um, how I manage my intensive production on one acre. Uh, we have um, five main markets for our produce. Uh, we have uh, food donations. We uh, support uh, local, a couple local food pantries as well as some of the local um, shelters with food donations on a weekly basis. We have both a, a summer and winter CSA program. We have a five-day week on-stand, um, on-site farm stand from that runs about April through uh, Thanksgiving. We go to uh, a Saturday farmers market during the summer, and uh, we do year-round restaurant sales. Uh, which is really just to um, one or two restaurants, um, and that's, as I said, year-round. Next slide, please. Um, 
So this, I wanted to just talk a little bit about how those markets relate to the overall um, farm si uh, farm income. So as you can see, um, the CSA, the combined summer and winter CSA, uh, represents about half of our uh, gross uh, revenue for farm-based revenue. Another quarter of our farm-based revenue is um, from our farm stand, and then the other quarter is made up with donations, restaurant sales, and the uh, the farmers market. This pie chart is taken from our our finances, our financial um, software from last year. So in 2014, we did about $105,000 in sales. So um, you can see how that breaks out in this chart. Next slide. Uh, the staff of the farm is uh, pretty modest. Um, I'm the manager. I'm uh, employed uh, full time year round. I guess I should back up a second and say that the uh, the, the property itself was purchased by the uh, the city of Newton uh, when the Italian family who had owned it for the previous hundred years uh, passed away. They bought it to keep it as open space and as a farm. Uh, they didn't want to actually have the responsibility of running a farm, so they sent out an RFP, a request for a proposal, uh, for someone to operate the property for them. That organization is uh, Newton Community Farm Inc., which is a 501c3 not-for-profit. So we are incorporated uh, as an educational nonprofit doing farming and education. Um, and then I'm so I'm employed by them. This is not my farm. I'm an employee of the nonprofit. Uh, I hire one assistant grower every season. Uh, that person is full time. Uh, seasonal. I hire, they usually work uh, sometime in mid-March through um, Thanksgiving when our farm stand ends and um, and then a little bit into December for our winter CSA. Um, otherwise, uh, the only other field labor we have comes from volunteers, um, basically three categories of volunteers. Um, most importantly are our high school interns. These are unpaid uh, high school interns. Um, they're required to work uh, four hours a day for three days a week for a two-week period. At the end of that two-week period, this is intended to be a bit of a job training for them, either specifically for agriculture or for kids who are just sort of interested in agriculture. Uh, more generally, it's just intended to give them job experience. It's really tough for a lot of high school kids in metro areas to find any kind of employment experience. So uh, we treat this as a job, even though they're not getting paid. At the end of their two-week um, initial period that we sit down with them and we do a, a performance review. We talk to them about their strengths, uh, their weaknesses. We try and make it all very positive, but uh, some of the kids are um, thanked for their time and uh, sent away for the rest of the summer. Other kids uh, are invited to come back and we set up a schedule with them. Uh, those kids, that's they, they're here for the 10 weeks of summer vacation. We have about 20 of those high school kids for various numbers of weeks over that 10 weeks, um, and they are really useful to us. We also have public volunteer hours. Um, there are five sessions, uh, two on Wednesday mornings, two on Thursday mornings, and one on Saturday mornings. Those run May through October, and they're open to anybody who wants to drop in, uh, and that's really intended um, as part of fulfilling our mandate as a nonprofit. Um, and then we have our CSA shares who are, have a, a work requirement as part of their CSA share. Next slide, please. Uh, our equipment, we have a, a four-wheel, 30-horsepower uh, tractor with a loader that we use exclusively when it's running for creating compost. Um, otherwise, all of our, um, our tillage, our soil prep, and uh, our mowing is done with what's called a walking tractor. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is a two-wheel tractor that you walk behind. Uh, we uh, buy an Italian brand called Grillo. Um, some of you may be more familiar with the uh, BCS brand. Uh, it's a very comparable tractor. BCS and Grillo used to be uh, the same company. Uh, we uh, chose this tractor because it's an extremely heavy duty um, walking tractor. It has a diesel engine so we can run it on biodiesel. Um, for uh, tillage, we have, a, you can see in this picture, the orange uh, thing attached to the back of it is a reciprocating spader. In our intensive production system, we do a lot of tilling. Uh, we probably till every bed on average 10 times a season. If we're using a rototiller to do that, uh, we'd be creating a lot of plow pan. 
and we would be um, kind of pulverizing the soil and uh, destroying our soil texture. So I paid, I paid more, uh, significantly more, to get a spader, uh, and it's also significantly slower. But um, in our system of intensive um, production with lots of tilling, um, it was really important to choose an implement that would sort of do the least amount of harm to our soil, since that's our number one uh, resource. Um, we also have a flail mower that runs on one of these tractors. We have two of these little tractors so that if one breaks, we have a backup. Um, we use one as a dedicated uh, spading machine and one as a dedicated mowing machine. Flail mower, if you're not familiar with it, is sort of like a, a chipper that runs either behind or ahead of your tractor, in the case of a walking tractor, ahead of your tractor, and it pretty much pulverizes everything in its path. Um, this is, I think, just a really wonderful um, pairing. We can go from a, a standing crop of, say, broccoli that's been harvested. We'll take the flour mower over it. It pulverizes all that foliage and stalks. We run the spader over a couple times, and we can be planting that bed within an hour. It's just really important in our intensive system. Uh, we have a couple dibblers. Um, so our you know, in order to create a bed, we run our spader over the soil and then we roll it with a dibbler. It's a four foot wide dibbler because that's the uh, our bed sizing. Our bed sizing. Um, it has a fixed set of dibbles creating a hexagonal pattern every six inches. We plant every hole, uh, every other hole, or every third hole. So our entire planting system is based on those spacings. And then we have a second dibbler um, that we had to have built by a friend. Um, that can punch through plastic because uh, for the last few years we've been using a lot of uh, Biotella, the, uh, the organically approved um, corn-based plastic for things like eggplants and tomatoes and peppers. Everything else we do is done by hand. All our cultivation is done with uh, collinear hose and a little bit with wheel hose for things like paths where we have bigger spaces. All the harvesting is done by hand with uh, a variety of knives. Uh, we're a very labor-intensive uh, farm. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the farming, um, as I said, we're incorporated as an educa educational nonprofit, so we uh, provide educational classes year-round um, from preschoolers through adults. Uh, the vast majority of our programming is for uh, sort of preschool through early middle school, with a with the most of it being for you know like preschool to early elementary school. We found that's sort of the sweet spot for where people are willing to spend a lot of money sending their kids to programs. Uh, we also do outreach um, to the public schools, to private schools, to churches and synagogues in our areas who are interested in having people come to them and talk about sustainable agriculture. We have a number of events on the farm throughout the season to bring the community onto the property. And uh, we just recently completed a, uh, an internal renovation of our 1880s barn um, so that we can now use it uh, for our education program, but we also now offer it as a rental space to um, not really generate positive revenue, but to help defray the costs of operating our this new barn. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, Andy had asked me to participate in this webinar really to talk about um, two things, uh, managing uh, cover crops in an intensive market garden situation and uh, how to uh, how to go about dealing with all the, the planning and uh, coordinating of an intensive garden. So I'm going to start with uh, talking about cover crops. Next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, I just would back up for a second and talk about why do we worry about cover cropping in our, in our situation. Well, pretty much for the same reason that anybody who's farming is going to be worried about cover cropping. Uh, we want to protect the soil uh, from erosion here in New England. Uh, this year, it's uh, we we're having a very cold winter, but uh, almost no snow. So, if we didn't have a cover crop protecting our soil, our soil would be exposed to you know sub-freezing temperatures, wind, uh, intense winter um, sunlight, uh, which all is very bad for your um, your soil structure, and as well as um, a lot of uh, because it gets so um, desiccated, the soil can start to um, get a lot of wind erosion. Uh, we also um, use cover cropping to uh, maintain our organic matter in our soil. I use organic matter as uh, something of a proxy for general soil health. It's not uh, the only thing that matters, but it is a, a good indicator of your soil health. Uh, we are fortunate here to have uh, you know, inherited a 300-year-old farm that's been manured for a really long time. So uh, we hit, came into a farm that has about 7% uh, to 8% organic matter, and we've been able to maintain that over 10 years of intensive cropping. Uh, and part of that is 
by um, building the soil through cover cropping. We also use cover crops in the winter as a catch crop. Uh, for, if you're not familiar with that idea, it's the, notion, the idea is that uh, there's a lot of nutrients that are available in your soil as you're going into fall and winter that uh, if they are not actively taken up by a plant, they're just going to sit there in the soil and when the spring thaws come, all the snow and ice melt, all those uh, water-soluble nutrients are going to wash through the soil into the water table and you're going to lose them uh, as available nutrients. They're going to, and not only are you going to lose them for uh, growing your crops, but they're going to potentially um, pollute waterways. There's a lot of uh, concern these days coming out of at least our, our local um, extension offices about uh, phosphorus loading in uh, wa in wetlands, and we are adjacent to a wetland, so we want to try and limit the amount of uh, nutrient that we lose from our field. And then finally, we use cover crops to help uh, you know keep the uh, the weed pressure low. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a number of uh, methods that we use for uh, incorporating cover crops into an intensive cropping system. Uh, a really important one is undersowing. Uh, we undersow all of our fall brassica crops. We undersow our popcorn. We don't grow sweet corn. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we do grow popcorn. We undersow that, and we have a couple of uh, row crops like. Um, leeks and carrots that we are typically harvesting very late in the season, meaning uh, no, late November and even into December, um, and we would want to be um, undersowing all these crops. Uh, the timing of undersowing for brassicas and corn, uh, you know, we're really looking to um, distribute the cover crop seed into the beds as the canopy of the plants is closing, that is, as the leaf of one plant is starting to touch the leaf of the other, that uh, that pretty much means that you're not going to be able to get in there and do any kind of cultivation, either mechanical if you're a tractor-based or even with a collinear hoe if you're hand cultivating like us. So as that canopy close, closes in, we go through, we do a careful weeding, we put down our, our, uh, our cover crop seed, and then we incorporate it with a, by scratching into the soil. Um, for leeks and carrots, it's really it doesn't have to do with the size of the crop so much as the timing of the year. We're looking at uh, kind of uh, mid late September when there's not really going to be much more um, weed germination, so there's not going to be a lot more need to cultivate, and we can get that cover crop established. Um, you basically, you don't want to be getting a cover crop, trying to establish a cover crop, and having a bunch of weeds come up through it that you're then forced to hand weed. That's really counterproductive. Um, why are we? Why do we undersow? Um, we're doing the undersowing in uh, typically two situations. One is a long season crop that's going to be there in the field for a long time, which means that uh, if we undersow with the legume, we can do a lot of soil building while also getting a cash crop. Um, the other reason is that um, most of the crops we're doing this with are being harvested, you know, late October, November, December, uh, sometimes January. It's, you know, these are crops that are, you know, by the time we're done harvesting them, it's really too late to get much of a cover crop going anyways. And since they're, um, they're in such long season, we want to protect that soil. So we want to get the cover crop established while the crop is still growing. Um, in these situations, we're typically using, as I said, a legume uh, because we want to be doing some soil building uh, for the fall brassicas, especially for things like kale. We typically use uh, clover, and I like to use white clover, either New Zealand or Dutch, because they're um, very small. They top out at about 12 inches. Uh, we've tried using um, other legumes, other kinds of clovers, and they get too tall, and they start to interfere with harvesting and slowing down the harvesting, which is really um, not a good situation. Uh, for corn and for the uh, the leeks and the carrots, we would use vetch because it's cheaper than the clover, um, and uh, it puts on great growth in the spring. Next slide. Uh, we also do a little bit of uh, cover cropping through our no-till system. Um, we don't have uh, as elaborate a no-till system as Eric does. Uh, maybe I think we should look into a USD grant maybe, but uh, we started doing no-till a few years ago with tomatoes. Um, we've also tried it with uh, eggplants um, and uh, squashes, and uh, we kind of gave up on eggplant and squash. They didn't respond really well to it, at least in our system, but the tomatoes um, do absolutely great. Um, I started thinking about this because, um, as I said, we're tilling our beds about 10 times each per season on average, and uh, even though we're using a spader and we're doing cover cropping, um, I, I just I would like to not have to do that 
in our one acre intensive system, we don't have room to fallow anything. Uh, and so the no-till tomatoes were sort of a, a pet project for trying to figure out a way we could sort of fallow uh, in a system where we don't actually have land to fallow. Um, so the, um, the way we do it is uh, we would establish a cover crop in the fall, say um, ideally late August, possibly early September. The cover crop would be winter rye and um, hairy vetch. We use those because they are uh, not oh, winter killed in our zone. We're in zone six. Um, we establish them in the fall. The following spring, we let them grow until May. Uh, those crops both typically flower um, sometime around uh, early to mid-May. Once they're in flower, it, once they're uh, flowering, if you kill them or if you mow them, mow them or roll them, uh, they die very effectively. We don't have a roller crimper, so we go through there with our flail mower. A roller crimper would be much better, but uh, we use what we have. Um, after we've knocked that crop down and killed it, we go through just with post hole diggers and uh, plant our tomatoes, and then um, those tomatoes in late October, early November, when they're done, we would cut them down from their trellises. Uh, we would directly uh, broadcast seed a new cover crop, again, rye and vetch, uh, over those uh, vines that are now laying on the ground, and then run our flam over, over them using uh, the shredded up uh, tomato vines and any, any residual um, mulch as the sort of moisture contact to germinate next, the next season's cover crop. This allows us about an 18 month period where we haven't had to till those beds. Um, so it's not as good as fallowing because we're still extracting nutrients through the, because of the tomatoes, but it uh, allows us to uh, at least take a section of our field and not have to till it for 18 months. We do something similar with broccoli and garlic. Uh, this is just a unique aspect of our system where the number of beds of garlic happens to equal the number of beds of fall broccoli that we want to plant. Uh, we harvest our garlic in July. It's been mulched with salt marsh hay, so you know we go out there and we harvest the garlic out and we have these beds cover still covered with uh, the salt marsh hay. Uh, and instead of having to rake all that hay off or mow it and plow it in and wait for it de to decompose, we just plant the fall broccoli transplants right through it. And again, this gives us about a 17-month period where those beds uh, didn't have to be tilled. Um, next slide, please. Uh, then, uh, you know, the other thing that we do is um, we hopefully just try really hard to get cover crops on everything in our field uh, by early November. Uh, you can see in the picture here on the right, sometimes we don't get there and uh, we do end up with uh, beds that are left bare or with really minimal um, crops, but uh, we try very hard not to have this situation. Um, so pretty much uh, in November as our, our summer CSA is ending and we're gearing up for our fall one, we go through and any beds that are done with harvesting, we are um, broadcast seeding rye. Uh, we use rye because, uh, winter rye, because it will germinate down to 32 degrees. Um, and because we're doing this so late in the season, uh, we need something that's going to germinate in this really cold weather. We might uh, put down vetch. That really um, depends on uh, how late in the season we're getting it down there. If it's going, you know, if we're, if we're putting that cover crop in in uh, November, we're probably not going to do vetch. But there's also, you need to think ahead to the following spring if those beds are beds that, uh, you know, for whatever reason you're not going to need to get into and start turning uh, until, say, late April, early May, then maybe you do want to put down that vetch even though it's really late in the fall and just, if it, even if it doesn't really germinate in the fall, it'll germinate the following spring and you'll get enough growth out of that vetch to make the money you spent on it worthwhile. Um, as I said, um, all of this fall cover cropping is really just done with a, a chest-mounted solo broadcast seeder. Uh, we just go through and we um, seed that uh, that rye and or vetch onto the crop. Um, if we have a, if, it, if it's going onto a bed that has a crop with a lot of sort of residual organic matter, we would actually just uh, broadcast seed, then flail mow that residual crop in, to provide the moisture contact. Um, if it's uh, something like lettuce where there's really nothing left after we've harvested, then we would spade it in. But I try to evolve avoid having to incorporate cover crops in the fall 
with the spader if I can, just again to reduce the amount of tillage I'm doing in an intensive system. Uh, right. And because um, w one of the things I do then is I overseed my cover crops because uh, you are going to take a hit on germination when you don't incorporate it with the spader. Next slide, please. Um, I, t I just talked about this a minute ago. Uh, the the timing of late season cover crops, uh, there's some things to think about. Um, we had a, uh, a conference here um, this summer and we were talking about uh, carbon sequestration in the soil and building um, organic matter in the soil and one of the other farmers who was visiting here and presenting was saying, you know, well, you know, it's August and, you know, you should be starting to get your cover crops established <laughs> and I said to the, the other people in the attending that, uh, you know, for me in my system where I'm really trying to maximize my income because I only have one acre to um, support my farm financially on, you know, I'm looking at August as a time when I still want to be putting in a cash crop. Even September I might be putting in a cash crop, something really quick that, you know, uh, greens or arugula that I can still um, get a harvest out before the end of the year. Um, it would be great if I could get those cover crops in early, but for me, um, the financial incentive is pushes me towards putting in my cover crops late and trying to get more cash crops out of my field. Uh, how late is too late? Well, you can see in this picture, um, you can't see it very clearly, sorry, but uh, hopefully you can see there's little green hairs every now and again. This is winter rye. Uh, there's not a whole lot of growth there, but that there is enough growth that it's going to um, do the work of holding the soil together and protecting the soil structure. And again, whether I would use vetch or not at this time of year really depends both on how late it is in the fall and then, as like I said, how early I'm going to need to work up that that uh, bed in the spring. You know, uh, legumes, even vetch, which is a cheap legume, is still fairly expensive compared to, say, a, a grain like rye. And um, it's it doesn't really make any sense to put down that that legume unless the legume actually has enough time to get to that the stage in its growth cycle where it's actually starting to um, put nitrogen into those nodules on its roots, which means that it you know it needs to have quite a bit of growing time. So I wouldn't be putting uh, a legume on late in the season unless I was going to be uh, not turning the soil until fairly late in the spring. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so then the other, the other thing I was going to talk about was uh, planning and managing uh, for an intensive market garden. So this is a view across our field of our nice red barn. Um, you can see uh, we do pretty intensive production. So we do, um, you know, our, our bed size is, is standardized. They are five foot on center. So it's a four foot bed with a one foot path, uh, 50 feet long. And we have a, about 150 beds of that size. Uh, and you can see this hexagonal, um, in this picture you can see the hexagonal patterns created by that dibbler. So everything is in this sort of offset pattern which allows us about 30% more plants per bed than if we were planting on conventional spacings. Next slide. All right, so, um, you know, one think one of the keys for planning uh, and managing an intensive market garden is um, planning for succession. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised to hear people who really um, don't seem to be, be doing succession plannings or aren't, aren't familiar with it, so I'm sorry if this um, is old news to a lot of you people, to, to a lot of you, but uh, I think it's, it's really one of the keys. Um, I think that uh, the way to think about succession is to ask yourself a few questions. When do you want to start harvesting something? When do you want to finish harvesting something? And how long can you harvest it um, from a single planting? And that's going to give you, you know, how often you need to be planting this thing. So uh, the examples I have here, we plant carrots eight times. We plant lettuce 14 times. Uh, we even plant our tomatoes three, four, sometimes five times. Um, to go back to these earlier questions, you know, carrots, we want to uh, have carrots when our CSA starts in June. And uh, we want to have carrots until our winter CSA ends uh, at Christmas time. And uh, carrots have about a three week, you know, once they're harvestable size, you have about three weeks of harvesting before they uh, start to get split and woody and um, not really good for selling anymore. So we take the number of weeks that we want from our first harvest date to our last harvest date and we divide it by how often uh, 
we need to be planting. In the case of lettuce, you know, that might be every week or two, depending on the time of year, or maybe, you know, you can maybe let lettuce sit in the field for three weeks in the fall when growth is really slowed down. Uh, tomatoes we do this with because uh, here in New England we um, have really been having problems with late blights for about the last five years. Um, we are not certified organic, but we follow the organic practices. Um, and in fact, we choose as an organization not to uh, spray copper on our tomatoes, which means that we um, pretty much have to plan for um, losing our tomatoes as the season goes. And so we plant tomatoes um, a number of times uh, sort of as a planned uh, death due to disease. Next slide. Uh, the other way uh, to think about succession is uh, not in terms of a single crop like carrots, but in terms of a single bed. So, you know, say you plant those crops, uh, that, that first crop of carrots that's going to be harvested, in our case, uh, in early June for our CSA. You know, you still have a lot of the growing season left after those carrots come out of the ground. <clears throat> On a lot of bigger farms, that bed would then just be turned into a cover crop, but in an intensive system like ours, uh, we want to um, follow that cash crop up with another cash crop. Um, in the case of, in, in our case, we, you know, things like carrots and beans and peas and um, a couple herbs, dill and cilantro, are direct seeded, but everything else we do uh, is transplanted from transplants we grow in our greenhouse. Uh, the reason we do that is, um, say we want to follow our spring carrots with uh, some beets, if, uh, if I was direct seeding those beets, I would have to wait until my ha carrots were harvested out in order to direct seed those beets. And then I got to wait, you know, a week for the beets to germinate and then seven weeks for the beets to grow. Um, what I'd rather do is harvest those carrots out, spade the bed, and the same day or the next day be able to put in, you know, a three-week-old transplant for my greenhouse. That, um, that basically cuts down the amount of time that it takes me to grow a crop in the field. And field space for me is... Um, more valuable than greenhouse space at this time of year, uh, and it also gives us a leg up on weeds because we don't have that uh, you know two or three weeks when the beets are still really tiny when we're having to uh, cultivate to keep the beets ahead of the weeds. Um, the other way to do think about this is you know if you have tomatoes going in say the first week in June, you know can you get something in that bed and harvest it out of that bed before your tomatoes go in? So. Um, like I said, for us, we have we usually have a tomato planting around the first week of June. Um, when I'm planting, doing my spring planting, I don't want to just stick those crops randomly into my field. I want to think very carefully about, okay, my tomatoes are going to be in these beds, and uh, you know, here's my, say, arugula and spinach that I'm going to be done harvesting by the end of May. So I'd like to put those ideally in those tomato beds so that I get, you know. Get a crop, a cash crop, out of the beds before I even put my main season crop tomatoes into them. The goal on my farm is to get two to three cash crops out of each bed every single season, plus a cover crop. The exception, of course, being the no-till tomatoes. Nothing would be um, in the bed before that. But the sort of trade-off there is that we have not had to spade those beds for 18 months. Um, one of the reasons that I really I think that it's really important to think about what you're going to get in ahead or ahead of or after another cash crop is because uh, you know if we treated our one acre as um, the way a lot of farms do where you just are getting one crop per season out of it um, we would get be generating about a third of our revenue we're getting um, you know we're, we by doing this multi cropping in each bed we effectively increase the size of our field to uh, two to three acres. Um, the other way that we increase the size, sort of, um, of our one-acre farm is that we don't grow uh, certain really space-intensive crops like uh, sweet corn, uh, uh, winter squash, and uh, potatoes. Uh, those crops, uh, we have lots of bigger farms in the western part of our state that we can buy them from. Uh, they're able to grow them actually more cheaply than I can grow them. So I can buy them in and sell them at a markup. Uh, cheaper than I could grow them myself, and it allows me to uh, support a bigger CSA and a bigger farm stand and bigger farmers market than I would if I was trying to grow everything on my own uh, little site. I don't want to become just a produce retailer, uh, so I've very consciously limited it to a few crops like this. Um, another crop that we do that with, we have our own little orchard, about 30 trees, but we also bring in apples um, 
in the fall because our 30 trees, those, you know, even though we get like 900 pounds of apples, those sell in a heartbeat and um, people are beating on our door for more apples. So I th have thought very carefully about what I bring in and how it, um, how it fits into our markets and our goals. Um, in order to do this kind of uh, multi-cropping in a bed, we have to be able to flip our beds really quickly. That is, we need to be able to get it from one crop into another with a minimal amount of time. Uh, we do this by using this uh, flail mower and spader combination. Like I said, we can go from a standing crop of broccoli, uh, flail mow it, spade it, and be ready to plant you know, within even an hour, um, much less you know, a day or two or a week. So that's, that uh, choice of equipment was really key in for getting us to be able to do this multi-cropping. Uh, the big question in all this that Andy asked me as we were planning this, uh, this webinar was, how does this affect your crop rotations? Uh, next slide. Uh, it's really tough. I'll be just completely honest. We uh, consciously rotate tomatoes, um, but uh, almost a quarter of our field at this point is tomatoes every year, so we have a maximum four-year rotation, and on one acre that means the tomatoes are never very far from where they were the previous year, and I think that it might just be a bit of hand-waving that we do this at all, but we do do it. Um, I, I can't really, I know um, that uh, there are people who have elaborate systems for rotating crops and intensive market systems. I have not found one that really works for my system. Basically, I just want to be paying attention so that I'm not following those spring carrots with uh, another plenty of carrots and another plenty of carrots. Uh, I certainly don't want to be following um, brassic, one brassica with another, if at all possible, because uh, of disease and pest issues. Um, we do uh, sometimes, um, this, this, you know, this inability to rotate really effectively does mean that we have to be very careful with diseases and pests. We have in the past simply chosen, uh, as an example, not to grow beans for two years in order to break a cycle of bean beetles. Uh, that has been actually really effective, and the biggest challenge there is just being in communication with your customers so they understand why they aren't having getting beans a particular year. Um, we also have become really, really diligent uh, when we see pest outbreaks, even though it's really tempting to be like, oh, but we could pick that for another, you know, one or two or three harvests. As soon as we see that pest outbreak starting, we get rid of the crop to try and break the pest cycle. And we do the same thing with diseases. We've become very ruthless in getting rid of diseased and infested crops um, in order to manage uh, disease and pests in this system. Next slide. Uh, this is the, probably the single most important tool on my farm. Uh, this is a spreadsheet. Uh, it was originally produced by Brookfield Farm in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, they sell this for $25. It's well worth it. You'll get two copies, one with all of their crop planning data and one blank for you to create your own, as I've done. You can see across the top row the colored um, the colored areas. Those are those are help me to color code my different markets. This is one I plan. Uh, for each of the different market going down the left column are all the crops that I grow. And uh, what this spreadsheet does, I don't have time to go into it in more detail, but what this spreadsheet does for a given crop is it tells me how many units, say heads or bunches or pounds, I want per week for each market, and then it gives me a total for that market, and then it sums the totals for each market. So it tells me uh, far off to the right, you can't see it, on this screenshot, but far off to the right, it tells me, for example, how many pounds of carrots I'm going to need to grow for the entire season to meet my crop plan. Um, then from there, I need to go, uh, next slide please, I need to go to a planting schedule and I need to, again, break out that uh, total poundage. Um, I need to think about when I'm going to be harvesting them and create this crop schedule. Going down the left there, where the hand is, you can see all the crops. If I plant carrots eight times and lettuce 14 times and tomatoes five times, I list every single time I plant them. I have uh, I know a lot of farmers who just will do something on a crop plan like, uh, or a planting schedule like um, plant lettuce every two weeks. Uh, I don't do that because in the middle of the season, um, I don't want to have to be thinking about whether it's the week to plant. And it's certainly if I, I if with my staff, I don't want them to have to rely on it. I want to just be able to give them every week a list of the planting for that week. Um, so I list every single time I plant every single crop. Next slide. 
Um, I'm a really big advocate of keeping physical records on the, uh, these are examples of our farmer's market invoice and our CSA invoice. We also keep one of these for our farm stand. Uh, the CSA one happens to include food pantry records uh, because they come during our CSA distributions. But uh, again, I don't want to be relying on memory. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to think that uh, I'll remember what happened in May the following December when I'm trying to do my crop planning. So uh, I advocate for keeping physical records. On that previous slide, uh, the planting schedule, um, we list things like the, the planned planting date, but there's always a column called actual, and we write in next to every single crop when the, the actual date we planted it and any notes, like if we had crop failures or if there's something funky about it. Again, so that the following winter we have lots of data um, and then we're not relying on our memories. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, I guess that's the end. Uh, good, because I think we're running out of time here. But uh, that I, I really, um, I think that the most important thing for me to remain sane, trying to do $105,000 in sales off one acre, is um, spending a, a lot of time this time of year, December, January, February, doing um, my crop plan and my planting schedules, so that when I get into the season, I just have all that information there at my fingertips. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Greg, and thank you, Eric, for sharing your backgrounds and expertise with us today. Before we begin addressing questions, which Eric and Greg have agreed to stay on for a few minutes, uh, we have received quite a few questions. Uh, I do understand that some of you may have to sign off, and so I want to mention a few quick reminders. First, this webinar will be posted in the next few days on the ATRA website at www.atra.ncat.org. I also want to remind folks to please take a few minutes to complete the survey you'll see on your screen immediately after you close the webinar. And finally, don't forget that ATRA specialists are available to provide technical assistance to you. If you have any agriculture related questions, please either call our ATRA hotline or use the Ask an Ag Expert function on the ATRA website. The hotlines and Ask an Ag Expert are free services that are always available for your questions about sustainable agriculture. A big thanks to Eric and Greg and to all of you for attending today's webinar. Um, we will try and get to a couple questions here, but again, for those that we are unable to get to, we will be following up within the next few days. And so I'm going to go through here quite a few. Um, we have received a couple questions regarding insurance, and I'm wondering maybe, Eric, if you want to start, if you can mention, uh, especially in relation to agritourism and having liquor sure. on site, uh, issues related to liability insurance and any other insurance you carry. I'd be more than happy to. Um, First, our uh, lease requires us to carry $4 million of liability insurance. Um, so we really had to do that uh, just to begin the farm, which is a little pricey, but um, the amount of people that come to our site are uh, rather necessary. Um, it's also Whole Foods and some of the grocery stores required insurance of that magnitude. So it was, again, something that was necessary. We also, since we do have beer and wine, uh, we carry liquor liability insurance, which is a separate um, insurance setup that we've got, um, and then also we are we rent our farm out as an event venue, and when we have large groups or large festivals, we require them to purchase a one-time event uh, insurance and named, name us as additionally insured, uh, and uh, the property owners themselves. So we've tried to cover ourselves pretty pretty well with insurance. Um, it can be somewhat expensive, uh, but what we've kind of found out it's uh, kind of necessary. Thank you. And Greg, I don't know if you have anything to add or if this is through your nonprofit that they handle the insurance, but any uh, comments related to insurance? Um, I, I would encourage everybody listening to buy a, a general liability policy. We started off our farm with a million dollar liability policy, which is pretty cheap. It's only a few hundred dollars a year for us and well worth it. Um, it's probably <laughs> some of the best $300 you can spend just because it covers you. We actually at this point have $2 million because we were for a brief while selling to Whole Foods and they Whole Foods has been slowly but steadily ramping up their insurance requirements. Um, we also rent our barn and uh, actually because we were just starting that we don't have all the answers so it's good to hear Eric's ideas. Okay, thank you. And just a quick question here for Eric regarding aquaponics. Uh, there was a question regarding the need to separate uh, the fish into a cleaning tank before going to market. Um, 
this is something new to me, so any thoughts on this? Uh, sure. I guess I'll also say that our aquaponic system is not certified organic. Currently, as far as I can understand, there are not uh, there are no NOP standards for aquaponic chefs yet, or they're just now coming out, so we have not certified them. Uh, what we typically do, um, we'll occasionally, when we've done it, uh, is put them in a couple 55-gallon uh, freshwater drums for a couple hours before we take them to a processor. We, for our environmental health agency in South Carolina, cannot process them on site or would I want to process that many fish, personally? Um, but we take them to a, um, a commercial um, uh, fishmonger processor person. I don't know what their title is, I guess, but um, down the road to Palmetto Seafood, and they do all the uh, you know, processing for us. OK, and uh, I'm just going to go back here real quickly to the insurance component. And I just want to mention that um, on the ATRA website, we do have several webinars related to crop insurance and in fact we will be conducting one next week on the new whole farm revenue program uh, for those of you interested. Uh, getting back to a couple questions here, um, I guess for both of you there's been some questions on how you got uh, startup capital to, to start your farms. Would you like me to go ahead? Sounds good. Um, we are family owned, uh, we're an LLC um, Basically, my dad's retirement. Um, he was brave enough to put in a rather substantial amount of his own personal capital. Uh, and at this point, we still are not um, recouping much of that capital. We have been covering costs um, for about four and a half years now. It took about 16 to 18 months to start covering costs. Um, so it really, the majority of it has come from personal assets, both mine and his. Um, we do have two separate grants that are going on right now. One is a conservation innovation grant, which is a kind of a cost share uh, thing for the no-till production. This year we just received a value-added producer grant for our microgreen production. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, we do have an operating loan uh, that we can draw on if we need to that is, you know, uh, ties into my personal house. Um, so you know, it's all been, been family financed. Uh, here in Newton, um, there was a uh, so as the as the city was being petitioned to purchase the property, there was a concomitant effort to uh, sort of create the organization that would run the farm, uh, and they started fundraising, hoping that the city would buy the farm. So they were actually fundraising before the farm existed. Um, and then even after the farm existed and our 501c3 status wasn't yet approved by the IRS, we were fundraising. And uh, so we, when the farm started, um, we had about $40,000 in the bank that was uh, all from private fundraising. And I think the thing that I'd like to share with people is that, uh, you know, if you're going the route of, you know, trying to become a, a nonprofit, um, you can't fundraise until you have that status. What we did is we teamed up with a local conservation organization that was already well established and they um, basically the donations were made to them they were designated donations to another organization for the farm so then we would submit bills to this um, other organization so they're acting as an umbrella organization for us which is a great way for you to be able to do some fundraising uh, before you have your 501c3 status approved great thank you uh, here's a question for Eric regarding organic certification and um, the question is in regarding regards uh, production on uh, contaminated soil and how that affected your certification. Sure. Um, to delineate a little bit, the soil that we grow on for our vegetable production is not contaminated, first and foremost. Um, the aquifer adjacent or the site adjacent to us was, the aquifer, the water below us is. Um, so there's a you know a difference there. Um, we also did our due diligence and checked for heavy metals and everything um, prior to starting. Um, you know we also spoke with our certifiers so they understood what the situation was and also that we brought in city compost, which we um, also um, uh, looked into their soils as well and talked with the city managers on all of that and then got that tested. Um, so the soil we grow vegetables in is not contaminated. Uh, the site adjacent to us that was that brownfield originally, um, the basically they did their EPA uh, remediation up to the EPA standards and South Carolina standards. Um, we do not grow on that uh, 40 by 40 foot square 
uh, area that they've um, dug up and remediated. Um, I, to, next to that, we do grow some flowers, um, but again, those are not edible, nothing edible on any of that contaminated area specifically. Andy, if I could just say quickly, the city of Boston has, uh, j just recently, the city of Boston passed a new um, ordinance. It was the last bill signed by our outgoing mayor uh, before he left after 20 years, and it was to open up a ton of land in Boston, over 80 acres of uh, former um, residential or commercial lots to urban farming. Uh, but part of the deal with the city is that uh, if you are going to farm any of this land, you must put down a geotextile barrier and bring in soil, so it's very expensive. Um, but um, the city of Boston, at least, has said that the best way to deal with contaminated soils is simply to prevent them from being disturbed and certainly not to grow in them. Mm -hmm. oh, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Greg. Um, there's been quite a few questions regarding equipment and also a um, comment regarding the use of tractors and walk-behind tractors in, in cities and, and many ordinances in cities uh, prevent that. Uh, so definitely check and also always check with your utility companies before you utilities equipment. Um, and I also want to refer folks uh, who have asked a lot of questions regarding equipment um, that there is an ATRA publication called Tools and Equipment for Intensive Crop Production that I'd like to refer you to, and there's a lot of great resources uh, provided in that for, for further uh, information. Uh, Greg, a, a great question here regarding late blight, and a couple of folks are wondering if there's any issues with spreading late blight in regards to using your flail mower to chop it up and then till it in uh, with leaving the vines on the ground. Yeah, right. So. Um... If, hoping my extension agent isn't listening, because <laughs> my extension agent would tell me to uh, either cut the vines down and burn them, or rip them out and put them in black plastic and solarize them, or put them in black plastic and send them to the dump or something else. Uh, you know, all of that from a labor perspective is really difficult on a small intensive farm in the middle of the season. Um, so late blight is uh, is not soil borne. Uh, so you don't need to worry about contaminating your soil. Late blight is, you know, late blight must have a live tissue host to grow on. So when we uh, take those tomatoes down, if we're taking tomatoes down for late blight, we flail mow them and then we're spitting them into the soil. We would fertilize actually before we spade, uh, so there's a ready source of nitrogen for the so that the soil really breaks down uh, those vines really quickly. After you flail mow, um, there's not a whole lot of you know big chunks left. So that stuff, those tomatoes are decomposed pretty quickly. The big, much bigger risk, much, much bigger risk for late blight is uh, potatoes. That's probably the number one way that uh, they are being spread is people who uh, aren't digging all their potatoes in the fall, you, know, you always miss some, or you're throwing them on a compost pile that doesn't uh, get hot enough. Um, I think that's much more of a problem than tomatoes. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that, that was a great point. I remember when we first got late blight in 2008, we were told that we had to bleach all of our tomato steaks, and uh, we have since found out that the live tissue is, is the key, and so that was sort of an extra step that was not necessary. Yeah, when I mean, there's I think there's still a lot of fear around late blight. You know, when that in 2008, I remember like uh, we have a, a uh, I don't know if people are aware of Kraft, but it's the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training, and uh, we have a really active branch of Kraft here in Eastern Mass, and boy, that we meet every two weeks all season long at somebody else's farm to talk about something in that year. <laughs> Nobody wanted anybody coming to their farm. They're like, don't bring your truck on my farm. Don't bring your boots on my farm. And it was kind of craziness. People have sort of calmed down now a bit. <laughs> yep. And Greg, if you wouldn't mind mentioning the spreadsheet you used again, yeah, so uh, th these spreadsheets, uh, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it was produced by Brookfield Farm in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, I think that it's $25, uh, just sort of a nominal fee to acknowledge the fact that they spent a lot of time developing these things. But, uh, you know, they send you a, a CD or a DVD or whatever it is at this point, um, and it usually there's two copies. One of it has all of their... Uh, field planning data on it, so it has like their yield estimates and uh, things like that, and then they send you a blank one that you can fill in with your own data. And then, like my version, I have uh, customized from theirs in other ways as well. Because, for example, you know, it's uh, for something like lettuce where I'm planting 
uh, in this hexagonal pattern, not in rows. There, you know, like estimating yields based on row feet doesn't really make as much sense for me as just estimating yields per bed. Um, but you know, as long as you sort of know a little bit about spreadsheets, you can customize it, and uh, it's a very powerful tool. Yeah, thank you. And I would add, uh, my farm has been using that same spreadsheet for. I'm going to go back 15 to 20 years, and it was originally designed for CSAs, so you can input how many members you have and the crops, and it can spit out information based on basically what each member would get per share, uh, so you can basically plant according to that. Um, but there's a lot of great uh, software programs out there now, um, but this is one I've been familiar with as well. Uh, just going to finish up here with a couple questions. Um, you both had mentioned um, the amount of labor you have on your farms, but a couple questions have come in. If you can further expand on how you manage labor um, and how that sort of plays into this role of education as well on your farm, whether that's a separate position or if you all handle both, uh, if you could expand on that a little bit. And Eric, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I guess I'll start with the very beginning. It, initially, it was just myself and then one part time person. Um, as we've grown over the years, we've added employees as we've found necessary. Um, we currently have a field manager, uh, which I quickly found out that I can't be doing everything, so she has taken over uh, our kind of field management uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and I work with her uh, very in-depth on, on production. We have a greenhouse manager, an assistant uh, greenhouse manager that uh, run our microgreens seven days a week, and a couple support staff for them. Um, we have a delivery driver, um, and we have an office sales and marketing uh, full-time employee that handles all of our kind of you know, outreach uh, from the farm and orders and, and, and all that and invoicing. Um, and then we do have a couple of paid interns. Initially, we started out uh, with an internship program that was unpaid. Now we, they are paid. Um, we've had thousands and thousands of hours of volunteer time. Um, from people from the community, from either university, retired, semi-retired, uh, unemployed or underemployed people. Um, we rely a lot less on that now uh, than we did in the past. Uh, we've really gone to paying pretty much anybody that's necessary. We retain even over the winter time, even despite the woes of uh, cash flow and payroll. Um, but uh, we found it to be rather necessary to pay those that uh, are an integral part of our farm a living wage and provide insurance and um, do we, we deem as, uh, as necessary? Uh, in Newton, we, uh, I, so my presentation kind of, especially that slide of staff really focused on the farm specific aspects of our organization. Uh, like I said, we do offer educational programming. Uh, it used to be uh, the education was all done by me or volu a volunteer education committee. Uh, eventually, we got to the point where we could hire a part-time educator. Uh, this year, uh, she is up to three-quarters time year-round. Um, so our education, we take our educational mandate as a nonprofit very seriously. So um, we're really trying to grow her position. Um, she then hires uh, a couple teachers during the summer. Um, to teach, we, we do like these half-day summer programs. We don't call them camps because that sets in a whole new set of laws and regulations in Massachusetts. Uh, but we hire uh, seasonal teachers for our summer when we're offering a you know, ton of programs all at once. Um, a lot of our um, adult ed evening classes, like you know, we do things like uh, fermentation classes and canning classes. Those are often taught by volunteers. So a lot of our paid educators' job is um, organizing and managing. Um, all those all those classes and those volunteers. Uh, so her job is not just teaching the classes. Then we also have a 10-hour uh, week administrative person who helps us with our database and our website. Um, that kind of is a limit of our staff. Uh, the high school program, um, even though it's uh, it, it's run by me and the assistant grower because it's uh, we consider it more of a production thing. Um, yeah, and uh, and the my assistant grower and I manage the uh, the weekly drop-in volunteer hours and the CSA work hours. So all that labor that I talked about in my slide is managed sort of by me uh, and or my assistant grower. Actually, my assistant grower does a lot of it. That was the original reason eight years ago I started hiring an assistant was because uh, it was taking me too much time to work with the volunteers and I was falling behind my farm work. So 
uh, the person I hire as my assistant, one of the things I look for is someone who's really good working with people, likes education, likes to teach about farming. Uh, the other thing I would say on this question, Andy, is that uh, uh, when I, I used to, when I started hiring an assistant, uh, it was sort of on this apprenticeship model that's really popular here in uh, New England. I don't know if it's popular in other parts of the country, but it was sort of a weekly stipend based, very low pay, you know, I remember like eight years ago, like if you did the math and figured out like how much you were getting paid an hour as a apprentice on a farm in New England, you were probably making like, you know, <laughs> two or three bucks an hour. It was really, really bad. And the, uh, you know, the sort of, the way it was justified was, oh, well, it's an education. We're actually training the farmers of the future. Um, but uh, really, uh, that only works if your farm is, you know, pretty actively training people. I think that uh, I got a little dissatisfied with that model. And so a few years ago, I just went to paying my assistant uh, straight hourly wages. Um, he's well, he or she, uh, this year it's a he, uh, they're welcome to participate in our craft educational programs, but that would be on his time. Um, I don't necessarily feel like I have to train him in on the tractor, you know, like it's, I've moved away from a model where I really feel like I need to be educating my intern uh, to a model where I've hired labor. Um, so I'm looking for different things. Excellent. It makes me think that I actually paid for my first internship. Uh, <laughs> can, can I add a little more on ours as well? Um, Please. Uh, I guess as far as the educational side, for all the tours, one of our managers typically does them. If it's a kind of advanced college group or a group of other farmers, I typically are doing uh, doing those tours with them. Um, for our interns, we sign them up for any conferences or workshops that we've got going on, and it's a, a stipend uh, kind of semi-apprenticeship model, uh, which we're paying them as well. Um, but uh, we're kind of beginning to move away from that and go towards more paid staff as opposed to apprenticeship, kind of like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I would add, too, that um, there are differences between an internship and apprenticeship, and uh, regulations are sort of, I would say, becoming more sticklers to that within the IRS. Uh, so it's very important to understand the difference and where education plays a role within an, an internship or apprenticeship program. Uh, and I'd also like to refer folks to the ATRA database. Uh, it's called the Internship and Apprenticeship Database, where you can list your farm as well as search for internships and apprenticeships throughout the country. Uh, you can search by enterprise or by location as well, uh, and that is available on the ATRA website. Um, just a couple more questions here. Uh, one, uh, something that I, I was challenged with as an urban farmer, and this is for Eric. Uh, can you talk a little bit about managing multiple plots and how that affects uh, production <laughs> and labor? Sure. Um, we're really kind of getting into that uh, in full force this year. Uh, we did grow on uh, multiple plots last year uh, with that uh, new property over at the high school. Um, it was a first year growing on it. Um, we were literally driving our, our 65 horsepower New Holland tractor uh, 20, 25 minutes down the road on the road, uh, which is rather unsafe. Um, and that wasted a lot of time and energy. Um, we have since then bought a uh, International 140 cultivating tractor to stay out there at that farm, um, so we don't have to go back and forth. Um, it is a hassle going back and forth, and we're trying to reduce that amount of time with just our planning and coordination better this year. Um, the more remote site, um, our family property, we are basically only growing in the summertime and growing cat, uh, cover crops uh, the rest of the year. And basically down there we're growing more storage crops like potatoes, sweet potatoes, alliums, and um, winter squashes and pumpkins. Um, so uh, we really haven't grown in that, that further location uh, yet, and that's what we're anticipating. But um, it's definitely um, to the point now that it is becoming a lot more of a logistical headache. Um, but we are hopefully hopefully we'll adapt to it this year better than we did last year. Um, and we the scary thing is we're going from cultivating on about two acres to actually if you include everything all together at once we may have up to 12 to 14 acres in production all at once this year. So um, that's what most of my last month has been uh, doing our crop rotations planning and logistics for all of that. So it really also means more equipment and we're now since gotten a transplanter and a bunch of other 
cultivating equipment to be able to handle multiple locations. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, have either of you had any issues with vandalism, trespassing, theft, anything along those lines? Uh, we had our truck stolen, uh, I think, in our second year. I left the keys, <laughs> I left the keys in it, um, which is kind of on, on me, but ironically enough, it got returned to us. Um, we put a little ad in our local, what we call free time, saying, hey, whoever took our old brown farm truck, please return it. And a tow truck driver called us and said, hey, I've got it in the back of the truck here. It was missing its uh, you know, tires, lugs, battery, and uh, radiator, but um, we put her back together, and uh, she's running in good order now. But Besides that, um, absolutely no vandalism and other theft besides the truck that I left the keys in. So, I, I think I've left the keys in my truck hoping someone would steal it. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of like this one. <laughs> um, we, you know, uh, when the first maybe uh, two or three years, we had much more of an issue with it than we have uh, since then. And so, uh, so the first few years, you know, I, I live on site. Uh, that's part of the deal I, that uh, the, the nonprofit has to have someone living on site. So part of my compensation for farming here is living here as the sort of caretaker for the property. Um, and yeah, I would go out to the field and I would see someone like picking vegetables, and I'd be like, "Hey, what are you what are you doing?" They're like, "Oh, well, you know, I thought it was pick your own." I'd say, "No, no, it's not pick your own." Um, that's so we, we definitely had a lot of that the first few years, and uh, it's really uh, gone down since then. Um, I think as people are aware of it and uh, are, you know, aware that the farm is being actively farmed and how it works, we also we had our farm stand uh, burned to the ground. Um, that, I think, was just sort of our bad luck. Some teenagers out lighting fires one night burned three different things along our road, and one of which happened to be our farm stand. So I don't think we were really targeted there. Um, I do know some of my friends who farm close, you know, in Boston proper, uh, definitely talk about um, needing to have locking gates um, so that, to keep people out. Otherwise, uh, you know, all their ripe tomatoes will be gone the next morning. Okay, I'm just going to wrap up here with uh, two more questions. One is. Uh, a big question, but maybe you can just address it quickly, each of you. Uh, and there's been quite a few questions coming in regarding your irrigation and uh, whether you use drip or, or what you do for irrigation. Uh, we use micro-irrigation um, on actually all three of our sites. Um, the city root site is on uh, city water, um, and our water fee is pretty high, um, which is you know part of the problem of being on uh, in the city. The school site, um, we tapped into their well, but paid for out of pocket the irrigation, um, drip irrigation, and, and set up, which ran us almost uh, ten or twelve thousand dollars. And then um, on our family property, we uh, constructed a well and put in micro irrigation, uh, both at uh, that family property and at City Roots. We did get cost sharing from NRCS through the Equip program for transition to organic. So we did have some cost share for that, and if you're unfamiliar with NRCS or their EQIP program, please look into it. There's some cost sharing um, to help conserve uh, water, um, soil, and any resource. So there are some options that help cost share, but with those, you do have to pay for it up front, and then they reimburse you for a portion of it. So, um, But we are on drip on everything. We do almost no overhead watering unless uh, we're watering in a cover crop we spread or something like that. Uh, in here in Newton, we uh, we use a combination of uh, impact sprinklers, so overhead irrigation and drip. Uh, drip, we're really we're using drip in our. Um, we have uh, uh, two hoop houses in the field, uh, so we're using drip on those because um, well, we're using drip in the hoop houses. And then in the field, uh, anything that we're running drip on is uh, because we're using the biotel that. Um, biodegradable plastic. Um, so actually probably the majority of our crops are being irrigated uh, with overhead irrigation. Uh, the very first year that we started the farm, um, we had a, uh, a well company come in and they did an assessment 
and uh, there's a, there's there's two different kinds of wells. There's deep wells and there's shallow wells. Uh, a deep well goes through the bedrock into some kind of aquifer. A shallow well is above the bedrock, and you're really looking for a very specific uh, kind of gravel, really really coarse sandy uh, substrate. Um, for us, they found one tiny little portion of our field that might have that substrate, so we went ahead and took a chance and had them drop a pipe down there. At about 25 feet, they hit the bedrock. The soil, the, the soil profile wasn't what they were hoping for, but they tried it out anyway, and uh, we've been using that well now for uh, almost 10 years without any problems. Um, the really nice thing about that shallow well is that it cost us $3,000 to have it put in, whereas a, uh, a deep well is going to be 10,000 or more, so it was much cheaper for us. Um, then we also, you know, we we used to use that water uh, in our wash tanks for doing vegetables, but now with uh, with GAP and all the concern about disease, we're using city water uh, so that we have a potable water supply. Uh, it's illegal in the city of Newton. Uh, oh, it's not. It, wells, no matter what, no matter whether they're deep wells, shallow wells, no matter what, they're not considered potable water uh, in the city of Newton, so we switched to using city water for all of our washing. Uh, but the city, uh, because we're a farm, has given us a, a deal, um, basically an agricultural rate, so we pay water, but we don't pay the sewer portion of that bill, so it reduces the cost. Um, and, uh, yeah, but I think uh, I think that, you know, the, the issue, there's an issue of capitalization for sure, but uh, installing a well or some other kind of water supply to get off city water is money well worth spent if you can figure out a way to do it. And we can't have a well on our site because of the aquifer contamination, so we're unfortunately with the urban farm site required to be on city water. One, one of the other things I'd say, Andy, I was in uh, Portland, Oregon last August for a family wedding and uh, I just happened to upon a, an urban farm in Portland and uh, so I jumped off the light wet rail train and went over to check it out and they had um, you know one of these sort of triangular I don't know what they're called it's like a triangular canvas shade structure on posts and uh, they were put they had put that up as a water catchment it then went down into 55 gallon drums and um, they could at least have some of their water supplied by rainwater. Um, because again, they couldn't put a well in because it's an urban site, and there are restrictions when you're getting leases from cities on permanent structures. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was a pretty creative way to get a, at least some water. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to end on a, a sort of a big question, um, but there are still several questions uh, continuing to come in, so I, I just want to remind folks that uh, we will be following up with you in the next few days for questions we did not get, an, uh, get to, um, but I also want to just mention that this webinar will be archived and that many of your questions have been discussed, and so we may just refer you back to, to this presentation uh, for some quick things that you may have missed. Um, so I want to end on a, a sort of a big question that's been asked, and I'm not sure how comfortable you are answering it, but folks are wondering if you have any idea in terms of numbers, uh, in terms of pounds of, of food you are growing on your site, as well as if you'd be willing to share anything regarding your income, uh, whether it's gross or net, and sort of how that relates to uh, your farms. Uh, you, know, I, I, you can go ahead if you want, Eric, or I can go either way. Uh, go ahead. Um, sure. So um, there, are, there are lots of questions in there, Andy. <laughs> so you might have to remind me if I miss something. So um, you know, our farm our farm generated revenue last year was one hundred five thousand uh, dollars. I can't really tell you what our net farm income was because uh, you know we have a, we do events and public outreach and education, and it's just all sort of gets rolled into one budget. We've considered really trying to like divvy everything out into proportions of electricity bill for this and that, but uh, it's not worth our time at this point. Uh, so I think that our our overall budget for our farm is about uh, 170 to 180 thousand dollars a year. Um, we are going into our ninth year, and every year so far, we have actually um, come in at the end of this year having underspent on expenses and over-earned on income. So we've actually been able to um, bank money every year for the last uh, eight years, which is a really great situation. Um, 
Um, what were the other parts of that? Uh, it, 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 in terms of, uh, yeah, what were the other parts of that, Andy? Um, do you uh, have any idea in terms of how much produce you harvest? Um, well, no. So the, I mean, you know, if you if you figure that produce averages uh, for us at two dollars a pound, and we made one hundred and five thousand dollars, so that's you know, fifty two thousand pounds. Good way of looking at it. Uh, Eric, any thoughts? Sure. Um, I don't mind sharing. We, I guess I'll go through year to year. Our first, well, we were pretty accurate on expenses when we started the farm, but pretty inaccurate on the amount of income we might be able to to, uh, to do. And um, uh, we almost shut the doors about 12, 14 months into it. Um, we fortunately started a CSA at about 18 months in and, and kind of haven't really had to feed it financially since then. But I think our first year we grossed, um, Again, this is uh, gross, not net. Grossed about eighty thousand. The second year, about a hundred and eighty thousand. Third year, um, for about uh, two sixty. Fourth year, uh, three twenty. And this year, we just tapped out at about five hundred thousand, um, and that is gross. Last year, we netted. Sorry. Uh, 2012, I guess. No, 2013. We netted $10,000. This year, we were negative about $30,000, um, and that's due to the fact we bought a, another truck, a um, couple more greenhouses, um, really invested in a lot more infrastructure this year, and are hoping to recoup that this year. Um, it's the first time we've been operating a kind of loan to be able to kind of get the infrastructure in place for this upcoming year, which is pretty risky and a little scary. Um, poundage. Uh, I can't tell you offhand. Microgreens, I think um, we do almost 1,800, sorry, 18,000 or 20,000 pounds last year. I think is what we did. I was still calculating all those numbers. I think it was for the previous year. Uh, we do about $200,000 in microgreen production. Um, our CSA is probably around 40,000. Or these are all numbers in gross, not net. Um, our agritourism grossed, I think, 170,000, maybe. We netted about 50 or 60,000 on agritourism, and because of that, we're putting in more infrastructure um, uh, on the farm um, to accommodate that. Um, and our on uh, farmers markets and on-site sales were less than 10%, probably. I figured out acreage-wise last year we were only cultivating, growing on an acre and a half at the urban farm site, and including the the other um, school site was an acre and a half of vegetable production, um, and we uh, grossed forty thousand dollars per acre. Um, basically, half our fields are in cover crop, or half are in cash crops, so it kind of depends. But um, but um, hopefully next year we'll uh, come out with a, an income as opposed to. Um, negative numbers, but pretty much every year we've seen pretty substantial growth um, and have hired accordingly. Um, and I draw salary in, um, as opposed to um, pulling out uh, equity at the end of the year, so I, I do have a, um, a full-time salary and, and benefits as, as well. Excellent, and I, I think on that note, what better way to end on the point that um, you actually pay yourselves, um, which a lot of farmers yep. Don't don't do, and so I, I think that's a, an excellent point to end on. Um, so I want to thank Eric and Greg uh, for your time and expertise today. And uh, please remember that a short survey will follow on your screen after you close the webinar. I want to thank you all for attending, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Andy.